is there where she can get rehabilitation and Good morning. Grace to you and peace from the God who creates and redeems and sustains us. Welcome to the First Presbyterian Church of Lansdowne. It is good to be back and see you all again this morning. Um, we've got a few announcements before we begin with worship. Let me get mine pulled up here. Uh, so, uh, our liturgist today is actually Megan Giroux. She's stepping in for Sherilyn. Uh, Chris is running the AV desk. Derexa is uh, leading Children's Church. Um, and the encounters today are Harry and Annabelle. If you're worshiping with us on Zoom this morning, we invite you to put your prayer requests into the Zoom chat now uh, so that we can recognize those when we get to uh, the prayers of the people. On December 1st, from noon to 5 p.m. in Westminster Hall, we're gonna have our annual uh, Red Cross blood drive. Um, if you would like to sign up to schedule an appointment for that, uh, go to the Red Cross, redcrossblood.org and then enter FPCLPA, so First Presbyterian Church in Lansdowne, Pennsylvania. 
uh, to schedule an appointment, and that should get you to our event. Fall Bible study is resuming uh, after worship today, and then as far as I know, we will be going uh, in perpetual, in perpetuity, that's the word, um, from here on out, except for Thanksgiving Sunday, I assume nobody wants to meet at 7 p.m. on Thanksgiving Thursday, excuse me, Thanksgiving Thursday. Um, the Interfaith Food Cupboard is requesting uh, cans of tuna fish for the month of November. Um, and as a at, related to that, the Scouts are having their food drive next Saturday, uh, the Girl Scouts and Scouts BSA. Um, so the way that you can help do that is either bring them by next Saturday, or if you're in sort of Lansdowne proper, um, you can just put them out on your front porch steps and the scouts will actually come by and pick them up. Um, so that's next Saturday. Um, I don't know the times off the top of my head, but I think it's pretty much all day. Are we gonna do that on the same day? Okay, so at the same time, simultaneously, uh, we are also going to be doing our fall re uh, leak, leaf raking. Wow, I didn't have coffee this morning, as you can tell. Uh, fall leaf raking uh, next Saturday as well, so if you want to come by and help with that, that would be great. Christmas poinsettia orders are now uh, available in the narthex. The, the little sign-up sheet looks like this. And then Cheryl and Patty both have them out this morning as well, so please stop by. Um, they're all, all the information is on that sheet. Uh, we're supposed to, um, two-part announcement, this afternoon um, at 4 p.m., there's going to be a benefit concert here in the sanctuary um, featuring musician George Kilby Jr. Uh, it's, it's a benefit for the Opioid Crisis Action Network. Um, which helps to uh, alleviate um, opioid addiction and help people who are, uh, who are addicted to, to uh, help them with some of the social services um, as they're, they're going through getting off of that. George is supposed to be here uh, actually this morning for our anthem, but I have yet to see George, uh, so I hope that he is okay and that, uh, something, uh, that everything's all right. Uh, but the, the benefit concert will be at 4 p.m. this afternoon here in the sanctuary. Everyone is invited. I think they actually um, put out some flyers around the neighborhood, uh, so you may have seen those as well. Presby players are uh, moving their time from Wednesday to Sunday afternoons from 12.30 to 1.30 here in the sanctuary, and that's today. Yep, so that's going to be the new time going forward, 12.30 to 1.30 here in the sanctuary. If you were uh, visiting with us this morning, uh, I want to say welcome. We are glad that you are here. If you would like us to have your contact information, uh, there should be a blue uh, contact information sheet in the pew back in front of you. Uh, you can put that information in the offering plate if you would like us to have your contact information. Um, or you can go on to our website and sign up for the Weekly Chimes. If you see a face that you are unfamiliar with, please make sure to say hello and introduce yourselves. And please come and join us for coffee hour after worship, um, which will be in Westminster Hall right next door. One final announcement. Uh, we have the date for the Christmas luncheon. Uh, that's going to be on December 17th following worship. Uh, so go ahead and put that date on your calendars now. We'll have more information out about that as we get closer. I believe those are all of the announcements this morning. Uh, let us begin with worship. Good morning. Please join me in our call to worship. How long must we wait, O oh Lord? Though we do not know, we do not wait idly by. Keep our lamps trimmed and burning. Now hear our gathering prayer. Eternal God, you are from everlasting to everlasting. Though the span of human life is brief, you are infinite. 
Centuries ebb and give way to millennia, yet you are the same. You have been our dwelling place in all generations, our protector in the storms of life. We praise you and we thank you for your boundless mercy that sustains us all of our days through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now please rise in body or spirit for our first hymn, Seek Ye First, which is number 333. As far as the east is from the west, so far does God remove our transgressions from us, says the psalmist. With the assurance of God's healing mercies in our lives, we need not fear confession, but instead come with honesty, seeking wholeness in our own lives and in the lives of those that we may have injured. So let us confess to God those aspects of our lives in need of God's grace first in unison, then in silence. Let us pray. Holy God, your way for us is clear. We are to live so that the manner of our lives speaks of your goodness, your generosity, your infinite mercy. Too often, though, we forget the purposes for which you made us. Too often, when we might meet in humanity, with the reflection of your goodness, we turn aside. We return unkindness for unkindness. We cling to what might be shared. We avoid those who are not like us. We fail to give grace in the measure we have received it. Forgive us, we pray. Remind us that your goodness is enduring and your mercy is everlasting. For we pray all these things in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. By grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one might boast. For we are what God has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. Believe the promise of the gospel. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven.
join me in our unison prayer of illumination. Let your word dwell within us richly, O Lord. Let your truth ring as a clarion through the chatter around us. Hold us in this time that your wisdom may shape us to the depth of our humanity. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now we will have our first scripture reading from Psalm chapter 78, verses 1 through 7. Hear now the word of the Lord. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old, things that we have heard and known, that our ancestors have told us. We will not hide them from their children. We will tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. He established a decree in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel which he commanded our ancestors to teach to their children, that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and rise up and tell them to their children, so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. The word of the Lord. Okay. I'll see you, George, yet. So, I'm going to invite the children to come on down for the youth chat. We're going to do that now. Come on out. Good morning. Everybody doing? All right. So I've got something with me this morning. Does anybody know what this is? You see it? Yeah? Do you know what it is? A what? It's made out of clay. Yep. Yep. And on one end, it's got a hole, and it's got a little piece of rope sticking through it. Any idea? No guesses? No? Okay, so what this is, this is an ancient lamp. Uh, this would have been used by people all throughout um, the area of uh, where Jesus was living and for centuries before and after that. And the way it works is that in the big uh, hole here, you put olive oil, right? And then that gets stuck. This thing, this uh, piece of rope, that's essentially a wick, right? Gets, the, gets it wet, it soaks up the olive oil, and then you light this in on fire. And it lights up, and then it keeps a lamp burning for a really, really long time, for like several hours, even for just something this small, which is pretty good, right? Um, so in our scripture reading for today, Jesus tells a story about 10 bridesmaids who are supposed to be going to a wedding. And what happened was, is the groom didn't show up. Not exactly how a wedding is supposed to go, right? Yeah, you want at least two people there at the wedding, right? Who do you want? Yeah, the, the husband and wife, the bride and groom, right? Doesn't really work if that doesn't happen, right? But there's also all sorts of other people who are there to help sort of make it a really festive and enjoyable day. So part of the ceremony at that point was that the groom would come and from his house to the bride's house, and there would be this big formal procession, and all the bridesmaids would have lamps with them. Well, what happens if you've only got a little lamp and the groom doesn't show up when he's supposed to? What's that? Well, it's already lit. It's already lit. So if it's already lit and they're not showing up when they're supposed to, what happens? It's gonna burn out, right? You're not gonna have enough oil. Yeah, so in the story, there were five bridesmaids who had enough oil, and there were five who didn't. And the point of the story is that we're supposed to be like the bridesmaids that have enough oil. We're supposed to be prepared 
for the wait. We're supposed to be prepared for contingencies for things that happen. Now, we're not going to weddings every day, right? But we are called to live out our faith every day, right? So we're called to be prepared for ways of doing that. So what are some ways that we can be prepared for living out our faith in a daily life? What's that? Pray. Absolutely. Number one thing. Absolutely. We can pray. What else can we do? Go to church. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. One more thing. Give me one more thing. Read the Bible. Absolutely. Pray, go to church, read the Bible. You guys are nailing it this morning. So remember that as we go through, we're supposed to be prepared and we're supposed to always be preparing ourselves, making ourselves better for how we live out our faith life. And Jesus thought that the greatest or good way to do that was talking about lamps, which can be sort of confusing, which is why we're explaining it. Will you guys say a prayer with me this morning? All right. Dear God, help us to be prepared for whatever comes each day. Amen. All right, thanks for coming up, everybody. If you want to go to Children's Church, you can go with Mr. Rex right here, okay? brought the lamp up here so you guys could see it, just in case you hadn't seen one before. All right, let's see. Hello again. It's good to see you all. Okay, so we, uh, Last week was All Saints Sunday, so we sort of moved away from the sort of lectionary journey through Matthew that we've been going through. Um, but we're back in now to the 25th chapter in Matthew's Gospel. At this point in the narrative, Jesus is in the middle of preaching uh, his five, one of his fine, five discourses, and he's in the very last one. I know I've mentioned this before, but as a reminder, these five discourses or sermons are supposed to remind us um, re remind readers and listeners of the structure of the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, right? These are traditionally the five books that were attributed to Moses, and so these new five discourses of Jesus um, are essentially Jesus's five books, sort of trying to remind us that Jesus is like Moses. And in this final discourse. This time, Jesus is teaching specifically to his disciples, not the larger crowds, uh, concerning how to live until the end of the age. And so, in order to do this, Jesus does what he often does, is, is that he gives us a parable. Uh, so, listen now to the word of the Lord. This is Matthew 25, 1 through 13. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. And as the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight, there was a shout, look, here is the bridegroom. Come out and meet him. Then all those bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, no, there will not be enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the other bridesmaids came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. 
But he replied, Truly I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When I was growing up in South Carolina, there was a series of books that came out known as the Left Behind series. Is anybody familiar with that series? Yeah, a few hands go up. Uh, Yeah, uh uh-huh, yeah, we'll get there. In the last few years, I even think there was a series of movies that came out based off of these books starring Nicolas Cage, so we know the caliber we're dealing with. The premise of the books was that it followed a series of characters who were left behind on Earth after the rapture. After the time when, as the thinking goes, God has somehow magically raptured or taken all of the good Christians on Earth up to heaven, presumably then the world goes downhill and it is a fight for survival. Is that the gist of the stories? Yeah, okay. I never actually read them. It was meant as a way, though, to sort of scare children and teenagers into faith in a certain strain of Christianity that believed in this rapture theology. Basically, if you believe the right things, then you won't get left behind. Now, besides the major problem that the rapture is not a biblical concept at all, It did have the either intentional or unintentional consequence of making me and lots of other folks have a potentially unhealthy obsession with end times theology. There was a period in my life when the only kind of Bible study that I wanted to do focused around the book of Revelation. Particularly remember one Sunday school class when I had come home from college to teach the high schoolers. Um, that ended in nothing but blank faces when I wrote the word eschatology up on the whiteboard. Should have seen that one coming. Likewise, I had around that same time a college Bible study with some friends that wanted to talk about Revelation as well. That group only made it a few weeks through. Because it turns out that Revelation is a weird and complicated book. And so it is no wonder that people think something like the rapture might happen. However, we're not here to talk about Revelation, we're talking about Matthew. And today's passage also sort of talks about these end times potentialities. But what this passage shows us is, I think, two things. One, that we aren't the only ones who are fascinated by the idea of what the future may hold for us or what the, quote, end of the world might look like. And two, what this passage shows is that focusing on what happens after isn't nearly as important to Jesus as what happens before. All of these stories in Matthew that we are going to look at over the next several weeks, all in Matthew 25, in this final discourse, focus on our living, our discipleship, our actions in the here and now while we wait for the return of Christ. These ten bridesmaids or virgins, as the Greek actually says, show up to do their part in the wedding festivities. At that time, the tradition was that the bridegroom um, would come to the house of the bride and would then escort her back to his house in an official procession that would then begin several days of festivities. However, as we heard in the parable, Jesus tells us that the groom does not show up at the appointed time to begin the procession. Of the ten bridesmaids, only five of them are prepared for this contingency, and waiting with their lamps lit already, the lamps of five bridesmaids eventually goes out, And then they run off to search for more oil in the middle of the night. While they're gone, the groom comes, the procession and the banquet begin, and the five bridesmaids are left out of the party. This is one of those parables that easily lends itself to an allegorical or metaphorical interpretation. 
The bridegroom is Christ coming again. The wedding is the heavenly banquet. And the disciples listening to this parable, and therefore us, well, we are the bridesmaids, the virgins. And the only question then is if and how prepared we will be for the wait. Is our waiting twiddling our thumbs, staring up at the heavens and not really doing anything? As Paul would say, by no means. These final four parables in Matthew's Gospel tell us how to wait. And in this one, part of that lesson is to be on the lookout for the coming of Christ. And it's also about being prepared for it when it happens. I would venture to say that those preparations look a lot like things that we do already. When we visit and tend to the sick, when we clothe the naked, when we feed the hungry, all of this is that preparation. This week I was on vacation, I was having a conversation with a friend of mine who seemed pretty convinced that everything, on, that everything going on in the world right now is hell. That hell is not some place that people go to after they die, but that it is here and it's on earth. And I have to admit that I tend to agree with her sometimes. There's so much terrible, so many terrible things going on in the world. The fighting in the Gaza Strip has plastered news headlines for over a month now. Around 1,400 Israelis died in the attack on October 7th. And since then, over 11,000 Palestinians living in Gaza have died, including over 4,000 children. According to the numbers that I've seen, there are another thousand or so children missing under the rubble. Add to this the forced displacement of at least one million Palestinians from their homes, and that sounds a lot like hell. And all of that badness calls for a response. Because just as hell can be on this earth, so can the kingdom of God. That also is not some place that people go to after they die. When Jesus talked about the kingdom of God on earth, he talked about it as both a present and a future reality that we get to live into, that we prepare for, and that we make happen. And like the bridesmaids, some of that preparation is making sure that we have the tools and the supplies necessary for the journey. I told this to our uh, Bible study groups, but as we come into Advent, this is important for all of you to know as well. I spent almost the entirety of my senior year in seminary leaning into learning about the modern conflict between the Israelis and the Palestinians. I took classes seeking to understand how the three uh, major Abrahamic religions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam factor into this political and geographic conflict. Two weeks after the Eight-Day War in 2012, I traveled to Israel and the occupied West Bank and studying at the Tantor Ecumenical Institute in Bethlehem. I visited holy sites, sure, but more importantly, I visited with and listened to as many people as I could on all sides of this conflict. I drank tea in the home of Palestinians living in the heavily besieged city of Hebron. I did the same thing in the home of an Israeli settler living in the West Bank. I went to church with Palestinian Christians every Sunday. I walked the separation wall that now cuts the West Bank from Israel. And I listened to the stories of Palestinians cut off from their fields, their families, and their livelihoods. I even got to meet with and talk to one of the former speakers of the Israeli Knesset. I visited friends living in Ramallah and 
who were also working on archaeological sites in Jericho. I tell all of you this because as someone who probably has more than the average American's experience with what is going on right there, I feel a particular calling to help us, to help us have the tools and the knowledge necessary for the journey. Because the longer that this conflict goes on, the more consequential it will be for all of our futures going forward. And so as we move towards this Advent season, starting here in just a few weeks, the turning over of the liturgical calendar, we are going to be intentionally diving into this conflict, looking at Advent through the, land, through the lens of the land and the people of Palestine. Specifically, we will be looking uh, and using a book written last year by the author Kelly Nikondeha entitled The First Advent in Palestine, Reversals, Resistance, and the Ongoing Complexity of Hope. We'll be focusing our scripture around the typical Advent stories, but perhaps not with the same focus as you might expect us to have during the Advent season. Our Bible study will have conversations about this. We may even try to do some documentary viewings during the week. And I imagine that these conversations will bring up information that is new to many of us, maybe even contradictory to what we think we know about what is going on right now. And I imagine that it will elicit strong feelings and emotions. But I pray that it will encourage us to think more deeply and more critically about where we stand on what is going on. As citizens and residents of the United States, we are tied up in what is going on, whether we like it or not. As the historian Howard Zinn said, you cannot be neutral on a moving train. So in the coming weeks, I invite you to join in, to lean into this collective work as much as you are able. I will do my best to make it worth your time, your energy, and your effort. Friends, Christ calls us to be prepared for the wait, to be prepared for the journey. So let us equip ourselves the best that we can. In the name of the God who creates and redeems and sustains us. Amen. He thought that he was on after the sermon. He's in. <laughs>
Please remain standing and join us in our affirmation of faith, which is taken from a brief statement of faith. We trust in God, whom Jesus called Abba, Father. In sovereign love, God created the world good and makes everyone equally in God's image of all genders, of every race and people, to live as one community. But we rebel against God. We hide from our Creator. Ignoring God's commandments, we violate the image of God in others and ourselves, accept lies as truth, exploit neighbor and nature, and threaten death to the planet entrusted to our care. We deserve God's condemnation, yet God acts with justice and mercy to redeem creation. In everlasting love, the God of Abraham and Sarah chose a covenant people to bless all families of the earth. Hearing their cry, God created the children of Israel from the house of bondage. Loving us still, God makes us heirs with Christ of the covenant. Like a mother who will not forsake her nursing child, like a father who runs to welcome the prodigal home, God is faithful still. Please be seated. Friends, we come now to our time of joys and concerns for the prayers of the people. Chris, do we have any prayers this morning from those worshiping on Zoom? We have uh, prayers from Beatrice for continuing prayers for Dolores Fletcher as she recuperates. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. What other joys and concerns do we have this morning? Got one over here. It is. So if y'all can't see, Nancy Runk and Richard Smalley are up here this morning from Lancaster. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let's see. Um, Bill, can you grab the mic for me? Thank you. We're going to come back there. So Patty's got one here first. All right. I'd like to ask for prayers this morning for my mom, Ann Bedwell, who's having a hard time responding to meds in a negative way, and misses being here. Thank you. God, in your mercy, for our prayer. I see you, Dave. Uh, I like to ask for prayers for my friend Harry Hinkle. His um, aunt Lisa is very sick with cancer, and she's young, and she has well, she's been given five to twenty years. But um, she's very good, just starting chemo. So I would ask for prayers for him and her. Yeah, God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Praise to the men and women in the military who protect us in prayers for the families of the ones that have given the ultimate sacrifice. Amen. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Prayers for my mom. She's recovering from a broken hip in rehab. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer.
for my friend Katie's uncle, Richard McCormick, who was put on hospice this week. God, in your mercy, our prayer. Friends, with all of this and more on our hearts and minds, let us go to God in prayer. Eternal God, from age to age, you have made yourself known to us. You have reached out to us so often and so persistently. We know of your love for us from so many sources, just as we know we may draw near to you with the needs of our hearts. And so we do. Not as distant followers held at arm's length, but as your beloved children held close. So it is that we pray to you this morning with our concerns. For the world affairs beyond our control, we pray for your mercy. Keep us mindful of the people of Ukraine who continue to endure grinding war. For the people of Israel and Gaza and the West Bank, we pray for peace knowing that you alone are the source of shalom in the peaceable kingdom. For those in harm's way, we pray protection. We pray awareness and grace for ourselves that we may learn forgiveness in the face of enmity and prejudice. Teach us how we may serve you more fully in ways we cannot even imagine. We pray for needs closer to home for our own community. As pleasant autumn days give way to the cold of coming winter, we ask that you would open our eyes to the needs that are on our very doorstep. May we see those whose names are known to you and offer compassion and goodwill. We pray for victims of violence and gun violence in particular. We pray for all who practice the healing arts for their endurance and for their well-being. We pray for ourselves as well, our own material and spiritual needs. Where our members suffer from illness and affliction, grant your healing touch, bringing wholeness. For any in our midst who suffer from mental or emotional illness or addiction, give us understanding and compassion. For those who are lonely, may we be a place of friendship, a warm haven where love is shared. God, in this country this weekend, we particularly remember those who have sacrificed for our protection, for all that that has wrought on their bodies and their minds. And so, God, we make these and all of our prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now is the time for the offering. Um, as I think you all know, you can donate here in the plate or by mail or online. Uh, hear now the invitation. The abundance of God's providing is evident. The world brims with goodness, amply offered that our needs may be met. 
From this abundance, we may take what we need. In recognition of what God has provided us, let us worship God with our tithes and offerings. So we have George here now. Uh, I think we may have had a little miscommunication while I was on vacation, so I apologize, George. Uh, so George is going to do our offertory uh, this morning as well. So. Is one of those. Just stand right. This will probably get your guitar a little better. Just maybe here, just not right on it. <laughs> it's omnidirectional. So. Morning, y'all. This is one called You Never See the Hand Throw the Stone. They shot him down Cause he had a dream You should have heard all those People singing Singing down in Selma Marching in the street Singing we shall overcome All the way to D.C. Little skinny girl Sure could sing the blues She told the world about that Strange fruit Shining in the firelight Hanging off the tree In a strap suit Under lily white sheet You never see the hand You never see the hand Never see the hand throw the stone They nailed him up there on the tree Cause he raised the rabble at it Talked of peace And they hung out with the hookers And the beggars in the street Messing with the money Of the scribes and Pharisees He healed a sick some folks say he raised the dead, but I never heard exactly what he said. Oh, but I read some books, seen some preachers on TV. Man, I sure wish I'd have been there, satisfy my curiosity. And you never see the hand You never see the hand You never see the hand throw the stone so No, you never see the hand You never see the hand You never see the hand throw the stone Thank you.
Thank you so much. I hope to see y'all at uh, four o'clock this afternoon. Uh, we're going to have a nice presentation. Appreciate being here today. pray together our prayer of dedication. Holy God, you have given us what we need. Indeed, you have given us more than we need. Accept this portion that we dedicate to your work. Grant that we might be blessed in turn as we see your reign at work in the world and in ourselves. Amen. Our final hymn is number 341, Blessed Assurance. Thank you. So as you go out now into the world, have courage, hold on to what is good, render unto no one evil for evil, strengthen the weak, support the faint-hearted, rejoicing always in the power of the Holy Spirit. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and those whom you love both today and forevermore. Let us all say together, Amen. Amen.